If you're like me, then you've probably spent the occasional night, weekend, or let's face it, Wednesday afternoon, binge watching. From the latest Netflix series to all of the Lord of the Rings movies, extended edition, we've all indulged in a telethon or two. I mean, heck guys, I plowed through Tiger King like those tigers plowed through a side of beef, and I am not ashamed to admit it. I'm maybe a little ashamed to admit it. But before you dive into your next docudrama or the 10th rewatch of Parks and Recreation, why not add a little focus to your binge? I mean, it can be enlightening as well as entertaining. So today we've got some goal-oriented recommendations for you on Fact Bites. And just a reminder that if you like today's episode, you can give us a thumbs up or hit subscribe for more of our hot movie takes. So for today's recommendation, we are recognizing the queens of old Hollywood cinema. Women have been in the movie biz since it began, but they haven't always received the recognition they deserve. So without further ado, here are some of the classic ladies of film and the work that they did to shape the movie industry as we know it. Let's talk about the legendary Edith Head. Head was an amateur art student in California who wanted to go into design. Despite lacking any professional experience at all, Head was hired as a costume sketch artist by Famous Players Lasky Corporation, a studio that would then go on to be Paramount Pictures. By 1925, she was designing costumes solo for silent movies. By the 30s, Head was one of Hollywood's best and most beloved costume designers. Head worked with household names like Mae West, Veronica Lake, Barbara Stanwyck, Audrey Hepburn, an actress turned real life princess and also close personal friend, Grace Kelly. She also designed costumes for a lot of male stars like Cary Grant, Fred Astaire, Robert Redford, and Steve Martin, just to name a few. Many of the stars she worked with specifically requested her as their costume designer, and her home studio, Paramount, would loan her out to other movies. The reason? Head took the time to collaborate with actors and actresses in coming up with a design for their characters. What a concept. Head designed some of the most glamorous costumes to ever grace the silver screen, but she also understood that costuming was a critical part of storytelling. Costuming reveals a lot about a character and their state of mind, so the costuming can't just be for fashion's sake. It needs to convey the moment that the director is trying to capture. It was often stated that Head was able to transform actresses into their characters on screen, and those transformational costumes went on to be iconic to American film and fashion. In 1967, when she was 70 years old and still ready for another decade of designing, she left Paramount for Universal Pictures, a move that was probably instigated by Alfred Hitchcock. Head was the costume designer for 11 of Hitchcock's films after their first collaboration for Rear Window in 1954. Head was nominated for an Oscar a mind-blowing 35 times, and she still holds the record for most Oscar wins in the costume design category. She won eight times. She worked all the way up until her death in 1981 at the age of 84. Oh, and if that's not enough, she was also the inspiration for the character design of Edna Mode, costume designer for the superheroes in Disney's The Incredibles. Next up, Dorothy Asner, one of Hollywood's first female directors and first female director accepted into the Directors Guild. Arsner started her career as a film cutter all the way back in 1919. I say film cutter because film editor was not a profession yet. The film cutters would literally take the hundreds and thousands of feet of celluloid film and cut and paste it together. Arsner decided to pursue a career in directing after watching Cecil B. DeMille direct one of his many movies. According to Arsner, if one was going to be in the movie business, one should be a director because he was the one who told everyone else what to do. That's a real mood, Dorothy. Her first feature was called Fashions for Women in 1927. Arsner would go on to direct several silent films and Paramount's first talking picture, The Wild Party, in 1929. Wild Party was significant for two reasons. First, because of the addition of sound, and second, because Arsner rigged up a microphone on a fishing pole to make it easier for actress Clara Bow to move around in the scenes. This was the first ever boom microphone, a piece of equipment that video and filmmakers still use today. Over the next few decades, Arsner would go on to direct several films notable for their feminist themes. 
they subverted the culture at the time by featuring stories about complex women, relationships between women, and also addressing the male gaze. Yes, we are talking about subverting the male gaze on today's Fact Bites because Arzner directly addresses it in one of her seminal films, Dance Girl Dance. The protagonist, Judy, walks out to the front of the stage and in an almost fourth wall breaking monologue, directly scolds the leering male audience. She says things like, get your money's worth, and what do you suppose we think of you sitting there with your silly smirks that your mothers would be ashamed of? I mean, hot damn, that is some salt. Arzner is credited with launching the careers of several famous actresses, including Katharine Hepburn and Lucille Ball. After retiring from Hollywood in 1943, Arzner went on to teach at UCLA's School of Theater, Film, and Television. One of her students, Frances Ford Coppola. After the death of her longtime partner Marion Morgan in 1971, Arzner moved out of Hollywood and died at the age of 82 in 1979. Next up, we have scream legend Hattie McDaniel. McDaniel was a singer-songwriter who got her start touring with minstrel shows in the early 20th century. She was the daughter of two former plantation slaves and started her career with her older brother Sam. During the Great Depression in the late 1920s, early 1930s, Hattie scraped by working as a maid or a washerwoman while still pursuing her performing career. One of her most well-known roles, Hi Hat Hattie, was the star of the radio program The Optimistic Donut Hour. Although the program and her character were incredibly popular, her pay was so low she was unable to quit her day job. In 1932, she landed her first on-screen role in Hollywood. Although she was uncredited in many of her films, she was still able to make enough work to join the Screen Actors Guild in 1934. She worked alongside stars like Mae West, Shirley Temple, and Clark Gable, often repeating the same role of sassy maid. Her most notable role was as Mammy, the slave and then maid of the O'Hara family in Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind was released in 1939, a time when America was deeply segregated. Some genius had the bright idea to hold the film's premiere in Atlanta, Georgia, the film's geographic location. Unfortunately for Hattie McDaniel, that meant she was unable to attend on account of not being legally allowed into the theater. Clark Gable, her friend and co-star, was so upset he almost boycotted the premiere, but McDaniel actually convinced him to go. She was able to attend the Hollywood premiere, and director David O. Selznick did make sure she was recognized at that event. Her performance in Gone with the Wind was critically acclaimed, and she ended up being the first African-American Oscar nomination and then winner for Best Supporting Actress. Unfortunately, the Coconut Grove where the awards were held was also segregated, and the studio had to ask special permission to allow her to attend. She wasn't even able to sit with her co-stars. She was designated to a table in the back. Good Lord, America, sometimes. Despite the win, Mammy was considered a divisive figure. Many critics, specifically African-American critics, chastised Mammy as a harmful stereotype against other African-Americans. Hattie's older brother and sister were both performers, but while Sam McDaniel advocated for larger, less stereotyped roles for black actors, Hattie was criticized by some civil rights activists for continuing to take on parts that reduced African Americans to servants and hired hands. When confronted with this criticism, McDaniel was reported to reply, why should I complain when making $700 a week playing a maid? If I didn't, I'd make $7 a week being one. This emphasizes the real struggle that African Americans face in early Hollywood and beyond. Nevertheless, Hattie McDaniel was a voice for change. When the mostly white neighborhood that she and fellow actresses Louise Beavers and Ethel Waters lived in sued to have minority homeowners removed, McDaniel joined the team who took the case all the way to the Supreme Court for their right to live in the neighborhood. In 1945, Superior Judge Thurmond Clark ruled in their favor and they won the day. Finally, let's talk about editors. Editing is often referred to as the invisible art. That's because if an editor does their job correctly, the audience shouldn't notice. 
nowhere does this moniker seem more appropriate than for the women who shaped the art and craft of editing. Remember how I said that early Hollywood had to cut and paste together strips of film? Well, the job of cutting was designated to be women's work for several reasons. One, men likened it to knitting. Two, men found it tedious. And three, it was considered unskilled labor. So cutters or joiners were mainly dominated by women. It was not until filmmakers began to realize that editing could make or break their film that the term editor was used to refer to this position. One of the earliest female editors would go on to become a major influence over all of Hollywood for decades. Her name was Margaret Booth and she began her career back in 1915. Booth worked directly under L.B. Mayer, a producer who would go on to create the major studio Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, or MGM. She learned under the tutelage of director John Stahl and honed her craft by cutting together the strips of film that Stahl would reject from his movies. One day, when a scene wouldn't come together quite right, he asked to see one of Booth's takes on the scene and ended up using it in the final film. Booth attributes her success to her ability to find the rhythm of a scene and a film as a whole. She knew how to follow the dramatic action in her cuts and was a major force in the concept of the invisible edit. When films began to incorporate sound, Booth continued as a pioneer by learning to keep the sound and the picture in sync. She was nominated for an Academy Award for her work on Mutiny on the Bounty in 1935, but it was in 1937 that her career really began to shape Hollywood. Although Stahl had wanted her to join him at his own production company, Booth remained with MGM most of her life. This was a great decision because she soon became a trusted right-hand lady for the studio head LB. Every movie released by MGM had to be screened and approved by Booth, even though she did not edit a movie personally after 1937. Eventually, in her 70s, she left MGM to be a supervising editor for producer Ray Stark. Stark is quoted as saying that she saved many a film for him. In 1978, she received an honorary Oscar from the Academy Awards for her lifetime of achievement. And Booth isn't the only woman editor credited with having saved a film. In fact, you can probably thank a woman editor for at least one of your favorite movies. Ever hear of Jaws? Thank Verna Fields. Fields hated the look of the animatronic shark they were using, so she minimized shots of it, thereby increasing the scary, suspenseful nature of the movie. She probably saved Jaws from B-horror movie obscurity and won an Oscar to boot. How about Star Wars? Marsha Lucas, then wife of George Lucas, is widely credited with having saved that entire franchise. When the first cut of the movie came back, George Lucas hated it, so he asked his wife to recut some scenes, specifically the final space battle. Her recut of the Battle of Yavin increased tension and urgency, and in fact, she's reported to have told George if the audience doesn't cheer when Han Solo comes back in the nick of time, you've lost the picture. She was right, and the Academy agreed. She won the Oscar for editing in 1978 for Star Wars A New Hope. Some other major Hollywood heavy hitters who use almost exclusively women editors, Martin Scorsese, and Quentin Tarantino. I feel like now's a good time to make a comment about how women are always fixing things for men since like the dawn of time, but we don't have time to get into that right now. So while you're scrolling through Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or Disney Plus or Apple TV or YouTube Red, why not try checking out some of these titans of Hollywood? And these are just a handful of the women who shaped the industry. It doesn't even come close to covering everybody. I know I missed some, so if you have a name I should look into, leave us a comment below. Or if there is another goal-oriented binge you want us to recommend, let us know. Don't forget to subscribe, and thanks for watching. <laughs>